we are very pleased we are very pleased to have you on board on uh, the second session of our series on uh, nanotechnology and i'm pleased really to introduce to you dr malik naza who will uh, talk about nanosciences and nanotechnologies as a platform towards sustainable development goals attainment. Dr. Malik Maza is a native of North Africa. He holds a PhD in wave matter neutron optics from the University of Paris, the sixth is the current incumbent in South Africa of the UNESCO UNISA IT Labs NRF Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnologies and the Chairman of the African Network of Excellence, the Nanosciences African Network. He is joint, a joint staff of the University of South Africa and the National Research Foundation of South Africa. He is a fellow of various academies, including the African Academy of Science, the Islamic Academy of Sciences, the European Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the National Academy of Science of India and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Dr. Malik Maza, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear chair. Let me just uh, share my screen. I hope uh, you you see my screen now. Yeah, we do. Okay, let me go to full screen. Is it okay? Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Program Director, esteemed colleagues, senior and junior. I wish to express my gratitude to the Director, our Director General uh, and the management of EIS for their kind invitation. And uh, my contribution today is titled, as it was mentioned, Nanosciences and Nanotechnology Platforms Thoughts SDGs Attainment. What I would like to do with the uh, if you allow me to do so, is to instead uh, to give a general talk, I will, how, uh, uh, I would prefer to give you typical examples, uh, 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 finalized or more or less uh, uh, performed or carried out in the South uh, in partnership with the number of uh, countries in the South related to each of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. using the nanosciences and nanotechnology. So it's really examples which have been uh, finalized and validated in the South, being in Africa, the Middle East, and other parts of a uh, uh, member of the Islamic community. Uh, the field of nanosciences and nanotechnology is not new in effect. It's not something uh, that is far from the market in effect, we are using it on a daily basis. Our cell phones, if you remember colleagues, in particular my senior colleagues, uh, you would remember the previous cell phones, they were like talky walkie type, very heavy, around uh, uh, a kilogram or half a kilo, uh, 700 grams uh, weight. And we move it towards this one, which was smaller with still an antenna, but it was quite, uh, 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 voluminous, and we move it from different type of uh, cell phones until we reach it now the flat ones. And in effect, the flat ones, uh, relatively to the first ones where we were using only voice recognition type, here we have uh, face recognition as well as, a fa uh, 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 as a, uh, voice and face recognition. In addition to that, this flat uh, screen type are colorful, uh, high resolution and so on. And all of these uh, 
how can I say, all of these properties makes of the cell phone a small computer. In effect, this small computer has a, a, a million times more powerful than the first electronic which was used for the Sputnik, the first satellite which was sent in the space. And uh, uh, in effect, this, uh, this uh, cell phone that we have is a huge amount, contains a huge and colossal amount of nano systems. We, we are using the nano without uh, paying attention to it. Since its inception as early in the 90s, the public spending from different government was just rocketing in a very, in an exponential type from both, of course, uh, from the mainly the, uh, uh, the, no, the, the standard economies as in the past, but uh, followed rapidly by countries in the South, in particular, China and India, but China extensively. And this uh, uh, funding has reached the billions of expenditure. Of course, you would, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, you would agree that uh, we were expecting that indeed the US will dominate, but uh, China came uh, straight forward after uh, of, uh, the same thing for Russia and followed by another uh, and uh, other countries. But uh, this is uh, 2015 and in 2019, China has surpassed the US in terms of investment in the field of science, uh, in the field of nanosciences and technology. And it, in effect, uh, it is now a billion type industry. And by its nature, by its nature, nano uh, requires uh, an international cooperation because of the problems that we are facing are uh, proper not only to one country or one region, but they are related to humanity as a whole, to the global uh, human community as a whole. And therefore <clears throat> it was necessary to cooperate. And as you can see, even between two different uh, nations with who politically would not stand together for a number of reasons, but they were obliged to cooperate. That is China and the USA. And of course, uh, uh, not only between them, but involving other countries in particular in Europe. And now quite a number of uh, 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 countries from the South, that is uh, uh, the BRICS, for example, uh, countries that is Brazil, South Africa, Russia, and China and India, or IBSA, India, Brazil, and South Africa. So there is definitely a move towards uh, more and more uh, regional and international cooperation in that regard. Just to give you an idea, colleagues, uh, how small is the nano? So if you take one meter, you divide it by 1,000, it gives you a millimeter. If you divide that one millimeter, you divide it by 1,000, it gives you a micrometer. And if you divide one micrometer by 1,000, it gives you a nanometer. So it's a really very, very small. And to give it uh, just a, a rough an a idea, relatively to an atom, uh, uh, an atom of a gold is around 0 0.1 nanometer. So if you take 10, a necklace of 10 atoms, uh, one close to each other, that will give you that the necklace of 10 atoms of gold would give you a nanometer. So it's extremely, very, very, very small. But nonetheless, it is now, it, uh, now we have the capabilities to manipulate matter and to shape it and to uh, handle it at that level. So we can, as in the case of the DNA, Mother Nature works at the DNA level. So the, the DNA is building a block and here the nanometer scale is the building block. And colleagues, the outline that I would like just to go through without you, uh, with you, sorry, uh, my apologies, with you is uh, to give uh, generalities on uh, nano and to single out, uh, 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 sorry,
to single out uh, some uh, potential uh, nano in the mother nature to show that na mother nature is rich in terms of uh, nano uh, 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 applications and so on, uh, or nano in nature, and uh, how mother nature used it to make it very, very, very effective. And uh, after that, I would go to give real examples of nano sciences, which was translated to nanotechnologies, but in the South, not in the North, in countries in the South, to show that we are capable in the South now to come with the nanotechnologies, which uh, can be translated to the society and the benefit of humanity as a whole. And I will end uh, by some conclusions and trends, colleagues. The field, the term of nano was coined by Norotani, the Japanese. Uh, uh, he was the first one to use this term of nano. And uh, in the line of what uh, Richard Feynman has mentioned, Norotani Taniguchi has stated that we will be able to control matter in the year of 2000 uh, and to build, to use it, uh, to use uh, nano scale as a building block as the equivalent of the DNA for the, uh, for the living species. And uh, 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 Rich Fine in this, uh, has uh, mentioned that in the year of 2000, we would be able to make devices and uh, uh, to further uh, the uh, industrial revolution uh, uh, using this uh, in emerging technology in the uh, in the twenties, and in effect, uh, the now is not Roman as well as the Indian community in the past, but in particular at the fourth century. Uh, 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 the Roman, they were uh, mixing nano colloids of gold with a glass, uh, and which gives it uh, different colors, red, violet, green, and so on. This is, uh, how can I say, and this red color or this uh, 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 green color of uh, the glass uh, is due to the gold particles which, are, which were embedded in the glass itself. And uh, above of that is that as early as uh, uh, the living species in the, uh, 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 on Earth, uh, nanoparticles were used by bacteria, as you will see further. The nanoparticles, you can see it as a small, tiny spherical particle consisting of a, a number of atoms, of course. And these atoms, in effect, uh, the atoms in the surface will vibrate in a different way, uh, in a, how can I say? And uh, uh, this, the, the electrons inside of this particle will behave uh, in a quantum mechanic uh, based behavior. And these properties of matter, uh, uh, the fact that these atoms will not vibrate, uh, will not dance, if you wish, in the same way as if they are the bulk, the same thing for these electrons or the, the free carrier. I would not go deep in the science of it, but just to give you an idea is that uh, uh, the electrons, which are uh, 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 the atoms, which are the backbone of any matter, do not behave in the same way. Like this, uh, the same thing is that uh, if you take a huge, uh, a large block of uh, gold, for example, and you cut it into small particles, small cubes, you will see that in effect from this big piece, big chunk of gold, you will be able to have a huge amount of small cubes. And these small cubes have an enhanced properties relatively to the bulk piece of gold, for example. I will, uh, how can I say, and gold at the, uh, uh, bulk at its a bulk form, it's yellow, but at it when it's at the nano scale, uh, it can be yellow, of course, 
but it can be red, it can be orange, and it can be blue, green, maroon, and so on. And by controlling the size of the goal or the shape of it, you can tune its color. And this is not for uh, these beautiful colors are not uh, uh, interesting in terms of their color by itself. No, they are, inter they are interesting when they are bioconjugated with the molecules uh, for a drug delivery in nanomedicine or for a virus identification uh, uh, and the bacteria uh, uh, killing and so on. So uh, the nanoparticles of gold uh, in such a form here where you can change their color, again, they are not for uh, jewelry application, but they are for nanomedicine application in particular and uh, 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 killing agent identification in particular. And the same thing for silver, which is metallic, which is uh, whitish. The, the silver at the, its nanoscale, it's like uh, triangles, small triangles, and its color is no more metallic, whitish, but it can be tuned. And this tunability is very, very effective in nanomedicine applications. And the gold, it melts at a high temperature when it's a bulk, but it can be liquid at room temperature when it is nano. So its melting temperature depends on the, its size. Smaller is the size of the gold nanoparticles, smaller is its melting uh, uh, temperature. And this is extremely important in medical applications in particular and in uh, formulating biocompatible materials. For dentistry, for example, for dental problems and so on others. The same thing, there is a property that we call a band gap in materials. And this is extremely important. When, if you take a bulk material, some materials that we use extensively on our, in our cell phones, their uh, band gap is fixed at the bulk. But when they are nano, we can tune their band gap. We can make them instead uh, uh, luminescing, for example, the colors that you see on your cell phone or on your flat screen, being it a TV or laptop. The colors that you see, in effect, they are not rare earth materials, but they are materials, uh, sulfides, uh, uh, zinc sulfide in particular. And these zinc sulfides, they have different uh, sizes. Those who are, uh, how can I say, large, they emit in the red. Those who are very small, they emit in the blue. So the blue colors on your cell phones and, the lap uh, and your laptops and so on, they are due to these nanoparticles which are embedded within your screen. And in effect, the zinc sulfides uh, nanoparticles that you have on your in your screens embedded inside them, they do luminous at different uh, 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 colors. And these colors, the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, are due to this phenomena of the band gap. Also, at the bulk material, the crystals, they have a, set, a fixed shape, like the zinc oxide, that we use, for example, uh, when, as a UV protector to protect our skin from the UV radiation from the sun. So to avoid the skin cancer, uh, this zinc oxide in its uh, bulk form has a, di a definite shape, but at its nano scale, you can give it any form that you wish. A nano belt, a nano ring, a nano sword, a nano crosses, uh, nano uh, tetrapods and so on, and uh, nano needles and uh, nanoparticles. These nanoparticles of the image of uh, number four is the form of the zinc oxide that we use for our cosmetic, uh, as a cosmetic to protect our skin from the skin cancer, from the UV radiation from the sun. While number five, we use it for gas sensing for a CO, Mo gas mono uh, carbon monoxide 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, noxious uh, uh, oxides detection and uh, uh, other forms are used for other microelectronic uh, applications. Just to show you that in effect, at the, at the level of a nanoscale, we can control the shape. And if we control the shape, we give the fun uh, additional functionality to the material. And here in the zinc oxide. Well, the nanomaterials that we use and we, in our daily uh, uh, usages, they have different shapes. Either they can, pre uh, they can possess a form of nanoparticles, uh, nanopowder, in a form of small nanoparticles, and or these nanoparticles are embedded in a host material, or the, we can have what we call carbon nanotubes or tubular uh, nanomaterials. And these nanomaterials, they are very long indeed, but their diameter is less than 100 nanometer. Therefore, they are nano, like cigarettes type, like cigar type. This we, occur, we call them nanotubules. And also we can have them in a form of sandwich like this or a, a multi-layered sandwich, what we call a multi-layer. So uh, these are the different forms of the basic nano system that we use. In your flat screen, for example, we use the glass screen. If you touch uh, your glass screen, you will find uh, that in effect, uh, uh, there is a, a thin film of uh, 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 transparent conducting material uh, and uh, 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 how can I say, mixed uh, sometimes mixed with these nanoparticles to give you the different colors. While the thin film covering all the screen of yours is in effect, it conducts electricity to activate your flat screen. Uh, in a real life, this is how it looks like. These are nanoparticles of uh, uh, titanium. These are the a real image of electron microscopy. These are nanotubes of palladium, mm -hmm. uh, platinum, which are used in uh, a car exhaust to decompose the NOx and the carbon monoxide to, 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 to how can I say, which is a very, very harmful. To, uh, uh, through the uh, which is emitted by the cars, but uh, it goes through the exhaust. It's the uh, the platinum decomposes it to change it to CO2 and less harmful oxides. And here you have nanoparticles of silver, which are used to identify to uh, be bioconjugated by uh, with active molecules to kill cancer cells. And here nano rods of gold, which are used to detect anthrax, for example, uh, by, via plasmonic uh, uh, response. And here nano belts of uh, zinc oxide, which are used as a, a gas sensor. And here uh, multi-layered systems uh, used for uh, mirrors in space applications, for example, uh, to observe these uh, photos from Mars and so on. We use this multi-layered this system, uh, the multilayer systems. Uh, colleagues, uh, allow me just to give a, a clear idea you know, from where we came and from where we are going. Well, uh, nanosciences or nanotechnology is not new. It's a part of different revolutions that humanity has faced. Coal industry in the in 17th, uh, 1750 and, uh, and above, nuclear era in the 50s, 60s, semiconductor in the 70s, biotech in the 80s, ICT in the uh, 90s, and the nanotech uh, since then. And in effect, uh, uh, this nano, it's, uh, it was not uh, something which was innovated uh, from scratch. No, it was the public. It's yourself, myself, our children who required for it. If you remember when we were student, at least from in my case, I was using this a very large uh, uh, 30 centimeters, over 30 centimeter uh, and uh, 
two, uh, one millimeter thickness IBM disks to store uh, information. And I was not able to put uh, an MP3 music. It's impossible because its capacity was really, of storage was very, very small. And uh, we move it to the terabyte now where we can put uh, thousands and movie or thousands on, of movies on it and a huge amount of uh, uh, songs and documents, images, and so on and so on. It, it happened that uh, here the, the terabyte, uh, once they are reaching like uh, USB now, it's uh, something of the around uh, five, uh, even less, uh, five centimeters uh, size, over three centimeters uh, size. And it can be less. How it comes that uh, the size is decreasing and the data storage is increasing? We go from some kilobytes here to a terabyte. Yet uh, we are uh, we the size is small. Well, the reason for that is that before on these uh, disks that we were using, I was using when I was a student, the size on which we are. Uh, we were able to store the zero and the one as an information. It was a millimeter cube size. And now with the terabyte sorry, systems, we can store that uh, uh, information, the equivalent of the zero one in a one nanometer scale cube uh, surface. So it is uh, uh, because the capacity to store the information in a very small area that we created via nanotechnologies allows us to store huge amount of information being it in a form of a, a, a music a image whatever all brings uh, is breaking uh, is break broken to zero and one type of information so because we we're capable to make matter and to manipulate matter at the nanometer scale. So we are capable to store material uh, information at uh, such a small scale. That is why the size is decreasing and the uh, capacity of storage is increasing. And you would uh, uh, remember this young boy, uh, this young man, uh, Bill Gates, when he came with the, uh, the, the, the disk as a star storage, which was around 700. Uh, 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 70 to 700 megabytes. And just to give an idea how much documents we will be able to store is he piled the corresponding amount of pages uh, uh, to show how much information can be stored in this. And that was Bill Gates when he was young, a young scientist. And of course, it was natural for us as a, uh, uh, a human society to go that route. Before we were going to, uh, we, uh, we were uh, manipulating matter at the level of a millimeter and then a micron and that nano, nanometer. It is normal because uh, 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 life system, living systems, they were operate at that level, at the DNA level. If the DNA can be very long indeed, its uh, thickness, its uh, basal, uh, dimension is in a nanometer. So it was just natural, uh, more or less, to be able to reach that level of manipulation where Mother Nature operates and where living species operate. So uh, the DNA self replicate in a certain way and to get, uh, how can I say, functionality and to have, uh, to give a birth to a living species. So for the moment, we are now capable to manipulate matter at the nanometer and to make nano devices, nano robots, nano uh, uh, components, which have functionalities, which allow to fabricate and manipulate uh, 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 matter at different levels. And in particular, to come with a functionality which is overperforming the traditional way of, uh, uh, how can I say, of uh, technology. Again, colleagues, just to give a clear idea is that uh, this was more or less the, expect the growth up to 2015, and it is expected that we will be reaching uh, 
10 billion US dollars per year and set to grow by 20% over the next three years. Uh, and in effect, the same trend from 2020 uh, up to two, the and this one that I have mentioned in effect colleagues before, and now this was to up to 2015, but 2020 China overcome the USA in the, in the investment in nanosciences and nanotechnology. By its nature, nanosciences is multidisciplinary. Yes, it has started in the material science era or materials engineering and move towards all the disciplines, being it physics, computer, uh, uh, chemistry, engineering, computer sciences, which allowed us to have uh, a high uh, capacity of storage, and of course, environment, uh, agriculture, and ecology. But certainly, the field which came with the largest amount of applications uh, of uh, nano systems is the, med uh, the, me the medical and the life science and the health sector. And uh, because this multidisciplinarity of nano sciences, it is uh, ideal for countries in the South whereby uh, infrastructure is not uh, uh, a panacea and well, uh, the high uh, how can sophisticated equipment is required that can be, not be duplicated. Therefore, it brings different uh, disciplines operating and working together to address a specific program, which is of a benefit for the human society. And in that regard, it, nanosciences, it's ideal for the countries in the South to increase uh, their critical mass uh, via this, uh, uh, via this uh, multidisciplinary approach. So bringing chemists, physicists, medical uh, life scientists, uh, agri sector, uh, environmental scientists to work together. So to increase the critical mass of each country and to uh, avoid duplication of uh, equipment and to produce more, more knowledge and uh, be able to translate the R&D. And uh, uh, I wish just to give uh, some typical examples and I will, I will not go through the details of how mother nature has used these nano systems far above us. <clears throat> millions, of year, millions, year, millions of years ago. I take this typical case of marine spirillum strain bacteria. It's called, it's one from the family of the magnetostatic bacteria. And this bacteria, we all are, we know that the bacteria is was the first living species uh, on earth. And uh, this specific magnetostatic bacteria in particular, they have small nanoparticles of iron sulfide or iron oxide inside their body and they use it uh, to orient themselves. If you take this bacteria in the North Pole, this bacteria will go only up and down, up and down in terms of motion. It will not move perpen perpendicular uh, parallel to Earth, but only perpendicular to it, not parallel, only perpendicular. The same thing happens in the south. But if you take it to the equator, it will move parallel. Why? Because it feels, it orients itself according to the magnetic field of Earth. And uh, how it does it? The magnetic field of Earth, it orients these magnetic plots, these small magnets inside of its body, and uh, form a necklace like this, uh, a linear chain, a magnetic chain. And that uh, shows the bacteria the way to move. And uh, yet uh, uh, here it's a high resolution colleagues, uh, 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 some uh, 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 term, uh, image of uh, these plots, as you can see inside the bacteria, and they are less than of the order of 50 nanometers. And they can be, they can they have different forms, either cubes or uh, spheres or uh, needles type, 
or small, very small spheres, or uh, how can I say, ellipsoidal type nanoparticles. Doesn't matter, it depends on the pH uh, of the medium where they are growing. It give, they give you this, uh, this nano small magnets inside them. Believe it or not, these are iron sulfides and iron oxides, highly crystal nanocrystals. And uh, it was only in 2005 that we have uh, that uh, doubles and dispirito uh, and it all have identified the mechanism of formation of these nanoplots uh, inside uh, the bacteria itself, in, inside the cell. Yet, uh, Mother Nature has created this millions years ago. It is only in 2005 that we were able to identify how these magnetic plots are uh, produced in this uh, 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 natural nanofactory of the bacteria. The same thing, uh, uh, the nano is in all uh, species of leaves. The leaves are consist of the granai and the tilacoids, of course, surrounded by uh, surrounded by uh, chlorophyll. And if you take the size of the granai and the thickness of the tilacoids, you will find out that they are less than 10 nanometers. They are nanoscaled. And they are, uh, uh, how can I say, they are, uh, uh, they take a shape in a way that to give you, they bend themselves to give you like a multi layered system. So to have a high efficiency of conversion of the sun, of the light to electron holes, and therefore uh, reaction with the carbo for the composition of the CO2 uh, to carbon and oxygen, and the carbon is used. Uh, to form carbohydrate and so on and so on. So because the, tila, uh, the tilacoids and the granite are within the nanometer scale surrounded by chlorophyll, that the photosynthesis is very efficient in addition to the time scale, of course, of it. Uh, uh, the, the, how can I say that? The uh, silk of the spider is also of an interest because if you take uh, uh, this two typical, the nephila and the trifaciata uh, uh, spiders, and if you measure the, the toughness and the breaking strain of their, uh, 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 of the fibers of these two, uh, spiders, you will find that, for example, they are tough, very, very tough, relatively to the to the steel or to the PBO, the Kevlar or nylon, which are man-made materials. These are the toughest material that the, the human being have managed to engineer. But as you can see, they are far smaller than the one uh, uh, of uh, the spider silk made by uh, uh, the trifaciata and the clavipes, the nephila. Why? For the simple reason that in effect, the fiber of the spider here consists of uh, very hard bricklets. Their size is uh, around 45 nanometers. And uh, these bricklets, there are many of them, and they are linked with the polymeric chains, plastic, plastic, uh, 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 chains. And uh, this toughness of these spiders is due to these bricklets. Many of them connected. You can guess that it's a necklace of a bricklet uh, of this material here uh, connected with the plastic and elastic type polymer. And therefore, this toughness is due to that because they produce internally uh, when they produce their uh, uh, through their spinnerets, uh, they produce these fibers. They produce uh, these bricklets with the elastic, very hard bricklets with the elastic polymers. And uh, there is a molecular recognition of this molecule uh, of these polymeric chains to come in and to strand uh, and to uh, bind to these bricklets. Uh, 
the other one that all of us we know is that uh, we have seen that quite a number of leaves do not uh, allow water to wet them. The water always cannot make a, a thin film on it, uh, on the on the leaf of some species of, of some uh, plants, but they form a droplets. Why they form a droplets? Why they cannot wet uh, that surface? Because whatever the size of the surface, small or big, why? Because the leaf has a small spikes on the surface, on its surface, they have small spikes, and these spikes, they are at the level both in height and in uh, diameter, they are in the nanometer scale. And therefore, the, it is this uh, nano structure, nano antennas who made who make uh, the surface hydrophobic. And therefore, the water or any liquid cannot uh, wet the, uh, the, 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 uh, the leaf surface. And of course, you would understand that uh, uh, scientists and engineers have made a, a paint uh, that uh, when you coat on a glass, uh, water, uh, how can I say, in particular for skyscrapers, uh, water cannot stick, and therefore uh, uh, it forms droplets on these surfaces of glasses uh, in skyscrapers. And uh, uh, this, uh, by gravitation, these uh, droplets, when they are big in size, they, they go down and they take with them all the dirt on the glass and cleaning the glass in skyscrapers, for example. The same thing for cars. Uh, uh, I would like to just escape this one if time allows I come to it. Otherwise, in terms of typical examples, colleagues, in, uh, 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 in relation to SDG 7 and SDG 11, that is sustainable cities and affordable clean energy, I would like to share with you this typical example, which is made in the South by South scientists and coming to the market. Uh, sorry. Colleagues, this is the uh, Enqvist uh, diagram, which tells us what are the energies who are good or somehow who are uh, CO2 footprint positive and those who are CO2 footprint negative. Those who are in the negative are the ideal. And as you can see, and those who are in the positive here uh, are uh, more or less, uh, do generate extensive amount of uh, CO2 footprint. If you can see here, colleagues, air conditioning and uh, insulation uh, uh, improvement as well as fuel efficiency are ideal. We need uh, really to, uh, have uh, uh, clean or green air conditioning. If we can minimize the usage of air conditioning or come with the, uh, uh, with the smart air conditioning and the smart uh, uh, insulation improvement and the smart fuel efficient, that we would really be able to uh, contribute uh, uh, to the CO2 footprint positively. So in that regard, in particular, colleagues, you, you will, by 2050, more than 61% of humanity will be urban. They will be an exodus uh, from a rural to urban areas. And of course, you can expect that uh, the meter square in cities will rocket. And therefore, the architecture will be likely more uh, vertical than horizontal. And therefore, quite a huge amount of glass will be used at that, uh, at, uh, in this case. And just to give you an idea, colleagues, in terms of air conditioning footprint, currently we have 1.6 billion uh, air conditioning unit used currently. But by 2050, the total number of air conditioning system expected is 5.6 billion. And the electricity requested or required to operate this 5.6 billion 
air conditioning unit by 2050 is the energy consumed currently by the USA, Europe, and Japan. You would understand that it is unsustainable. Therefore, it is necessary to come with a, a new form of air conditioning, smart one, not uh, the traditional one. We can't sustain. We just will kill a climate change. We will definitely not be able to address it. Therefore, it is necessary to come with a, with a, a smart uh, nano solution. And that regard, in effect, uh, uh, this is more or less the world energy map uh, uh, distribution. Uh, uh, by 2050, it is expected that if we do not address climate change, these blue regions will shrink. Uh, and how can I say? And uh, the green uh, regions here would become also orange. Therefore, it is necessary to implement smart air conditioning everywhere in this area, in, in the globe. And in particular, the sun, climate change or not climate change, will continue emitting its infrared radiations, which are the source of heat. And 52% uh, is in the near infrared, is heat generated from the sun. So these emissions will not stop. We, we have to control them. In that regard, we, how can I say, uh, both in the car industry as well in, in the housing sector, the energy to be controlled is through mainly through the windows, glass windows. So we need to have smart glass windows and therefore to be able to come with a smart coating on the glass windows to make them very uh, photoactive to stop infrared when it's required uh, in the summer and to allow the infrared to come in in the winter, both in the car and this, uh, in the car units and the house units. For as such, we have to emulate this uh, animal here. It's the Khams book uh, and it's called Al Maha. Uh, it's the logo of uh, Qatar Airways. Now it has been, a, before there was a, quite a huge amount of uh, this population of this Khamsbok, uh, Oryx, uh, in all the Middle East, uh, but because uh, the hunting of it and so on, it has nearly disappeared in the Middle East. It has been re reintroduced. Nonetheless, this animal is capable not to drink water for weeks, for months, for uh, sometimes years. Uh, without losing the water which is inside its body. How he does it? He does it, yet he is in, sorry colleagues, yes, he is in the desert, uh, and the desert in the, uh, in the Namib, at least uh, in the southern of, uh, southern of Africa, it can reach 56 degrees Celsius. And this animal goes in without any problem. Well, how he does it? He does it by controlling the, through its nostrils, the oxygen consumption. Uh, uh, at the, when it's hot during the day, when it's hot, he consumes less oxygen. During the night, it's cold. It's cold. It, it consumes a huge amount of oxygen. The idea, and it does it in a reversible way. During the night, it does not. Cons it consumes a huge amount of oxygen through his nostrils. And in the day when it's very hot, it consumes less and so on and so on. And it does it in an intelligent way, in a reversible way, day and night, day and night. The engineers ask themselves, what can be, can we biomimic this animal by creating a material which would have such a response, but that response should be not oxygen consumption, but should be electric resistance. Can we find a, a, a material which, uh, uh, for which the electric resistance can change in this shape here, in this form, with the temperature? Uh, there are low resistance at high temperature and high resistance at low temperature. Well, 
that material is a vanadium oxide indeed it does exist as you can see there is that change like that versus the temperature and here is the resistance what does it mean here that means when the material is uh, at low temperature when the temperature is low the resistance is high that means uh, when the resistance is high that means it is transparent to the infrared radiation therefore it allows heat from the sun to come in but when it is resistive sorry when it is uh, metallic so it less uh, when its resistance is low relatively low it is metallic and if it is metallic it reflects back the the infrared and therefore it reflects back the heat from the sun and it does it also it does it in a reversible way as you can see here for example a typical example as it was uh, for the uh, response of the uh, of the hans book well i'm not going through the science of it here is a typical uh, a toy house with a glass with a glass non coated uh, with that material vo2 the smart material vo2 and uh, close to it another similar toy house with a glass coated with this material as you can see inside there is a thermometer and here you have a lamp which simulates the sun its power is around 1.5 sun so with the glass which is not coated the thermometer measures a temperature of around 42 degrees celsius inside while the one which is coated uh, with that smart material uh, 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 the temperature is 33 it's nearly you can say nearly three uh, ten degrees of difference which is really very good in terms of thermal heat management so it shows clearly that in effect in this case this uh, the, the heat from the sun is transmitted through the glass while here the heat from the sun or the equivalent of the sun is reflected so if we cover okay, if we coat all our glass windows uh, in our houses uh, housing units and our cars with these materials we would not need air conditioning it's a green air conditioning. There is no energy input making this uh, thin film, uh, this uh, smart coating uh, reflecting the heat when it's required and allowing heat from the sun to come in when it is uh, necessary. Because this material, uh, it, uh, it, it's a smart, it's intelligent. When it is hot, it triggers its, itself to be opaque for the infrared. Uh, from the sun uh, from the heat from the sun when it is cold it triggers itself uh, to make it itself transparent for the heat uh, from the sun so there is no need for any energy uh, to operate it it's self-regulating it, it's intelligent and this uh, coating would come as a smart coating in all how can i say certainly in all uh, uh, skyscrapers in the future and in the cars. For the moment, it's limited just for some luxury cars, some luxury cars in German cars, but not the rest. But in the future, it will be a normal. It will be a new normal. And of course, this material uh, is used currently now for the, the small satellites uh, with, that we call nano satellites. They are 10 centimeters over 10, over 10. They are really small cubes, and these are the ones that Tesla and uh, Amazon and Google want to uh, send all over around the world to make internet accessible to everybody. And these materials, remember, satellites span its uh, its uh, spins around the, the uh, Earth. It orbits around the the Earth, and therefore it faces the heat of the sun half of its time and half in the cold air 
So you need to protect the electronic uh, of the satellites from the, the heat of the sun and the cold in the other part of the, the earth. And therefore, uh, Japan, Nice Space Agency, JAXA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency are now using it to coat their nanosatellites to, uh, to heat management and to protect uh, the electronics of satellites from heat. If you remember colleagues, uh, <clears throat> if you remember in the Enqvist, uh, uh, in the Enqvist uh, uh, diagram, we said that uh, fuel uh, efficiency, we need really to, uh, okay, to make the fuel of, uh, efficiency in vehicles in particular, very effective. For as such, uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, for such colleagues, uh, and in line with the SDG 11, because uh, uh, how can I say the transportation uh, in cities, which is a, a, bar, a the major a pivotal component, being it the carts or being it uh, transportation of uh, commodities and so on. Anyway, transport, and also in terms of innovation. Up to now, colleagues, <coughs> the fuel that we use in our cars uh, is the culprit and is the one which is defining somehow uh, the life cycle, the lifetime of our cars. Uh, and it's the engine who defines how much uh, fuel we consume and how much uh, NOx gases we emit. And for that, that uh, that the engine is in effect uh, not uh, independent. It it depends on the water and the ethanol uh, uh, the uh, the ethanol glycol uh, uh, ethyl glycol that we use and the water that we put in the radiator. In an engine, when it operates, the water coming from the radiator goes in to cool it and comes removes some heat from the uh, some heat from the the engine and bring it back again uh, to be cooled uh, through the fan you know uh, and uh, how can i say we have airflow uh, uh, re the heat removed and again that water is cooled when it goes cool when it's cooled it goes back again to the engine to remove some heat from the engine and to bring it again here to be cooled and so on and so on, it goes to that side. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the water or other liquids that uh, we use to cool the engines, uh, they do not have a high thermal conductivity. So when they reach the piston area to remove the heat, they remove the heat, but they cannot remove a huge amount of heat. There, the heat that you can remove is limited. Why? Because, because their thermal conductivity, the, that means their capacity of removing the heat is small, is small. Yet we, uh, we do use them, whether water or ethylene glycol or mineral oil, we use them because they are ideal. And, but if we see the metals here, like copper, aluminum, or their oxides, or, uh, yeah, uh, their thermal conductivity is hot, uh, is, sorry, is very high. Unfortunately, you cannot use uh, liquid copper in, uh, to cool an engine. No, it can't be the idea or uh, to use oxides. No, what we can do, however, is to take small particles of, uh, the, the, this metal or dioxide and put it inside the water or ethylene glycol or the mineral oil to enhance their thermal conductivity. If we do that, that is what we call nanofluids. That is the uh, next generation of coolant. So uh, uh, now this uh, the future 
generation of coolant that we will be putting in our cars or any engine would consist in effect of the normal host fluid that is water or ethylene glycol or uh, uh, or uh, 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 standard oil uh, containing nanoparticles of uh, metallic or oxides nanoparticles. And if we put that, the thermal conductivity of this liquid is enhanced uh, and of this fluid is enhanced and therefore it can remove a huge amount of heat from the engine. And here, for example, a typical case of uh, 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 a nanofluid which was uh, uh, formulated, it consists of small nanoparticles on the carpets of graphene. These carpets of graphene, uh, like these ones, are uh, covered with a huge amount of nanoparticles of silver. To give you this uh, type of uh, uh, nanocomposites in water or anything in glycol. And if you do so, you will find out the ethylene glycol, it's, uh, how can I say, its thermal conductivity is at this level here, <coughs> okay? But when you include uh, these nanoparticles, these carpets of graphene coated with the, coated with the silver nanoparticles, the thermal conductivity increases. And the thermal con conductivity of this material increases at the level of 33%, which is huge. That means this nanofluid can remove a huge amount of heat from the engine and therefore increasing its uh, 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 lifetime and uh, uh, minimizing the consumption of fuel and therefore minimizing the emission of the NOx, uh, the carbon monoxide and the NOx uh, gases uh, uh, in the city. And well, it happened that it is the highest, the, th the nanofluid with the highest enhancement <coughs> so far relatively to a number of uh, other uh, uh, materials designed in the, in the North, in the US in particular. And you can see colleagues that these uh, nanofluids have been uh, designed by uh, uh, involving colleagues from India, from a number of countries from the South, from India, from uh, South Africa, Iran, and so on. And it, uh, it is more or less a typical example of an R&D translation where a patent indeed has been uh, uh, finalized and uh, given uh, awarded, and therefore there is an, an innovation uh, in, in line with the SDG 9, and there is an R&D uh, translation, uh, as well as uh, uh, application in a car industry and a transportation, and therefore for smart cities, in line with the SDG 11. In terms of SDG 6, how I would like to single out a typical example whereby uh, uh, nano uh, materials have been engineered in the South, used uh, to develop, to translate the R&D and to bring it for uh, uh, a water treatment somehow in line with SDG 6. Because water is really of extreme importance and it's a huge challenge all over the world and uh, uh, bulk of the countries will be facing 30%, 37% of humanity would really face uh, water scarcity. And therefore, whatever water we, are, we do use, we should treat it. We can't rely, rely on our mother nature anymore uh, to, how can I say, as a source of supply. It's not an indefinite supply. We have to treat. We should not just remove to the sea. We have to treat our waters and to make them consumables. And with an African perspective, as you can see, uh, by 20, okay, in 1990, the, US, uh, the, the United Nations have made a study and found out that the bulk of the African countries, they, uh, how can I say, they will be moving towards, uh, uh, how can I say, scarcity. 
and vulnerability in terms of water. And as you can see, by 2020, 2025, uh, they have uh, 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 predicted that quite a number of African countries will be under the vulnerability uh, threshold and many of them will be under under stress and uh, some of them will be under scarcity. So this kind of problems of water would create conflict. And uh, we, have no, we have noticed some in the Sudan, for example, in the area of Sudan and Djibouti, but uh, not limited to that, other parts of the, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, 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 of the, the globe. So we have had, because we are facing all of us this problem of water, not limited to Africa. I simulated out of uh, the case of Africa because we are in South Africa and because uh, we agreed all of us to different scientists from different countries to work on the some subject and to come with a solution which would be translated in a cost-effective uh, technology will be used uh, in different uh, countries in, the, uh, in Africa and other parts of the world. And we have started with colleagues from Oman in this uh, regard, as well as uh, our colleagues from uh, Iran and uh, Pakistan. Well, as well as Bangladesh, uh, one technology which can be competitive, very competitive to the current technologies which are developed in the North, Germany, the US and so on. We can develop them in our home countries in the South. And some of them is what we call uh, photocatalysis, may synthesize nanoparticles of titania, titanium oxide that we use in tooth, our toothbrushes. We can synthesize them. Well, how can I say, it's not magic. We have the knowledge and the science to make them. And therefore, if you take these nanoparticles of titania, uh, they interact with light, uh, either visible or UV, for the moment UV, and uh, by uh, interacting with the, this specific type of material that we can produce in a form of powder or a paste, uh, they react with the different, uh, <clears throat> Uh, with the oxygen in air and water vapor to create very oxidative species. And these oxidative species are capable to decompose organic compounds, vox pollutant and malodorous gases. And well, also they are very active to kill organic acid, esterogen, pesticides, dyes, crude, decompose the crude oil, kill uh, my, microbes, uh, viruses and uh, uh, how can I say, inorganic molecules also from uh, artificial dyes. So a typical case that we have uh, done and was produced in a number of African country, including Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan is uh, the case of uh, nano titania. And we have shared the protocol with our free of charge with all of our colleagues because it is uh, a matter of not a benefit but a matter of saving humanity. Uh, and so you, if you take uh, this dirty water, you mix it with this uh, nanoparticles of titania and you expose it to the UV. And uh, well, after around uh, uh, eight hours, uh, uh, eight to 12 hours, sorry, it gives you uh, some water, which is, uh, how can I say, uh, quite uh, uh, keen to be consumed and you have to filter it only to, re, to regenerate this nanopowder and to use it to clean another liter of uh, dirty water and so on. And you can do it. We are now trying to develop the same thing, but uh, we should activate it with the sun only for rural uh, area application in particular, not the UV. So this is a typical response to SDG6. In terms of SDG 3 and SDG 13, I'd like to share with you colleagues something that is really of extreme importance to the South because the South has a very robust knowledge in terms of indigenous knowledge and uh, plant-based medicine and so on. And it happened that uh, these plants are of an extreme importance 
when it comes to bioconjugated uh, nanoparticles with uh, active phyto compounds or using a natural extract of these uh, specific plants to nanobiosynthesize nanoparticles which are biocompatible. And for as such, I would like to give the, the case of, uh, in particular, device nanoparticles, which are extremely very effective to skin cancer. As you can see, colleagues, the skin cancer is a really of a critical importance to a number of countries. It is a worldwide problem, not limited to some. And here, a typical case of a, a traditional, uh, uh, traditional plant, which is called the hudia in the Southern hemisphere. It's used uh, to cut thirst and to cut, uh, how can I say, the, uh, to cut uh, uh, thirst as well as uh, the amount of food that we consume. And uh, therefore it's used to remove fat and to minimize obesity. And uh, uh, one of the phytoactive compounds of this uh, 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 Hodia Gordoni uh, natural species uh, indigenous to Southern Africa, Namibia, Botswana and South Africa, is this uh, uh, long chain uh, somehow uh, uh, molecule uh, P57. And uh, the idea is to use the natural extract of this powder here uh, from the Hudia Gordoni and use that natural extract as a chelating agent, as an oxidoreductive uh, agent to make nanoparticles without using any acid or any base, only water as a universal solvent and the natural extract from this plant. And we have targeted this cerium oxide because this cerium oxide is of, of a high value uh, in terms of uh, uh, met, uh, uh, additive manufacturing, because it is used as a, a sunscreen, uh, uh, luxury sunscreen cosmetics. It's used uh, for solar, uh, for CO2 solar conversion to water. And this is exactly the one that was used in Mars recently. It's a cerium oxide based uh, compound which was used in Mars to convert some small CO2 to water. And also it's used solid oxid fuels and uh, oxygen storage, phosphorus and so on and so on and also as a fluorescence mark uh, uh, for fluorescence marking in uh, nanomedicine. Well, if you take water uh, and you, how can I say, you dissolve the, you, you get the extract of uh, this uh, plant, the hudia, uh, uh, and you mix it with the serum nitrate, uh, hexahydrate, and uh, you leave it at room temperature for around 24 hours, so allowing the thermodynamic to take place, you will end by getting nanocrystals. Colleagues, I hope that you will see that uh, there are some lines here. This is a nanocrystal of cerium oxide. And if you magnify with the uh, uh, high resolution electron microscopy, see here the bar is two nanometers. You have quite large crystals, very good crystals of this uh, uh, cerium oxide, as if you have uh, as uh, those you have, uh, you can make by advanced, highly advanced uh, processing, but here it's uh, biosynthesis, uh, properly biosynthesis at room temperature. Well, you go and uh, you do all the armada of characterization to see if they are uh, pure cerium oxides and so on. You'll find out they are very small crystals and because they are very small, uh, they are at the level of a nano here, uh, less than five nanometers in size, and therefore ideal. You go and investigate all their properties. You will find out it is a pure cerium oxide as good, if not superior to those that we make with the standard harsh chemical method or energy uh, hungry physical methods. 
But the end of the day is that when you measure the UV response to of this uh, nanopowder, when you scrap it on the surface, being its skin or uh, uh, a substrate, you will find out that it stops it stops the UV and it allows the it reflects the the visible and the near infrared. And in terms of uh, UV stopping, you would see that uh, uh, its uh, UV selectivity is quite large relatively to the inorganic and organic uh, cosmetics that we can find in the market, as you can see. Yet it was biosynthesized, colleagues. And uh, in terms of efficiency, is that these nanoparticles, these nanoparticles made by uh, nanobiosynthesis, they have very low uh, 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 formation of uh, ROS, uh, detection oxidative species, relatively to the standard ones. So it is not harmful at all. And in addition, it stops the UVA and the UVB. So it is ideal for uh, uh, to stop uh, and minimize the skin cancer. And also it happened that these materials, uh, these exactly speaking, uh, specific materials, they are as good, if not better than the gentamicin when it comes to the antibacteria for the E. coli and the pneumonia. And uh, colleagues, in terms of SDG 17s, and I will uh, end soon, in terms of SDG 17s, uh, in the field of nanosciences and nanotechnology is uh, multidisciplinary first, and it requires partnership. As I have mentioned completely at the beginning, uh, it, in this field, quite a number of countries uh, are cooperating, and uh, therefore it is, uh, it fits with the SDG 17. And in our case, uh, we do receive and host a large amount of fellows from Islamic countries and non-Islamic countries. And it's a pity that I have not mentioned my colleague, uh, colleagues that we have hosted extensively from uh, Pakistan and Iran, uh, and also from other parts of the, uh, the continent and uh, the US whereby we receive not only junior scientists and uh, postgrad, but also senior scientists. And that has allowed us more or less to enhance our visibility and our partnership to target and to resolve problems of a common concern. For example, the water uh, on which we have all of us worked. All these countries, <laughs> Malaysia, Bangladesh, and so on have worked on it. And uh, not least, but uh, last, uh, it's extremely important that uh, we, we were addressing gender equity, whereby we train a large amount of uh, female students. Why? For the simple reason for Africa and the, the rest of the world, in particular, the Islamic countries and the Middle East countries, uh, the GDP uh, increased as according to uh, how can the World Bank and the uh, how can I say number of organization? If we address the the gender gap, uh, the highest the highest GDP increase is expected in uh, uh, Africa around twelve percent, uh, India and the Middle East, as you can see, seven percent, nine percent, and nearly twelve percent in these regions if we address the gender. And therefore, it is extremely important to us to push for more uh, training of uh, female work, future workforce. And by that colleagues, uh, I wish to thank you all for your kindness and for uh, taking of your precious time and attending this talk. Thank you, shukran jazeelan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malik for uh, this very uh, comprehensive uh, lecture, which is it's really enlightening. And it has a lot of, uh, or you cover a lot of applications ranging from uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and water treatment and other 
and other things. And I'm sure that it will uh, elicit a lot of uh, engagement from the audience. Now I'll open the floor for uh, uh, the audience. If they have any questions or comments, please. Dr. Noor, Dr. Noor Bhatt, please. Um, let me first uh, thank Professor uh, Maza for a very extensive uh, and elaborate lecture in nanotechnology, which is our interest for the last years. And um, uh, I'm particularly thankful to him. Dr. Bhatt, uh, there seems to be an echo in, in your side. How oh, is that? Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, confirm the um, uh, Professor Maza's help to uh, our institute, the new nanotechnology institute in Islamabad. He has trained for uh, five young students, um, BS graduates as fellows in nanotechnology. And they have won uh, good uh, scholarships in the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences and uh, they have done a PhD is uh, based on his training of a few months each time. So uh, I think uh, Professor Maza is uh, a great contributor to the Islamic nanoscience and technology. Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, have um, appreciate his uh, uh, work for Islamic countries devotedly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Uh, Hamad, please go ahead. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thank you so much, uh, IAS and Professor uh, Malik Maza, for a wonderful lecture. So, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, the side effects, or you can say the negative side of the nanoparticle usage. As you said, we are using in a lot of fields uh, that nanoparticles are being used in coolants or glass coatings or many other applications, including biomedical applications and environmental applications. So what do you think that how can we um, meet the challenges regarding the leakage or um, you can say the spread of these man-made nanoparticles in uh, environment and uh, where do you think that if we compare the positive and negative uh, sides of these nanoparticles after 10 years or uh, 15 years, uh, where do we stand? I hope uh, you understand my question. So that's yes. it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear colleague. Uh, Hamad, you are absolutely right. Uh, uh, the nanoparticles themselves, it's not all positive. Uh, the, some of them are, uh, do, can exhibit uh, cytotoxicity and uh, uh, a degree of harmfulness. But uh, how can I say? Uh, it's size dependent and it's application dependent. You have mentioned the uh, also the fact that these nanoparticles will be released in a way or another in the environment. And for as such, indeed, there is a need to come with a nanofiltration uh, type uh, uh, system where, uh, technology whereby we have to catch again these nanoparticles uh, and to ensure that they will not uh, be released uh, uh, in, in the natural systems. And uh, for as such, we have to come with nanofiltration uh, nano and uh, nanofiltration and nanoregulations. Up to now, only, only Holland, Netherlands have imposed a policy in terms of nanoregulations. The European Union is drafting one currently. The US, there is none, but they are trying to draft it. And the South, therefore, it is necessary to come with the, uh, also a nano regulation worldwide. And it is of a firm belief that the United Nations has to come and more or less uh, 
uh, ensure that these uh, uh, nanoparticles, these uh, nano regulations are imposed and respected by all those stakeholders or actors in this field of nanotechnology and nano production of nanoparticles. Uh, and for as such, I think there is a need for within the EIS, there is a need for creation of a, a, a center of excellence, at least, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, at least uh, a virtual nano center within the EIS, because there is so much expertise, and in particular in terms of cytotoxicity and uh, how can I say, and the uh, uh, health side, the negative health side uh, of the nanoparticles. Quite a number of uh, 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 colleagues from Pakistan, from uh, uh, Iran, uh, are extremely very good in it and highly equipped in terms of both expertise and equipment infrastructure. So. We should really think, hopefully, the IAS could facilitate the creation of a virtual uh, IAS nano center in this regard, whereby this aspect of regulation and the health uh, uh, aspect of the nano systems is addressed. That is from uh, my side, Hamad. I hope that I responded to your uh, question. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. And uh, I think in my opinion, if, uh, if there will be any regulation which uh, may limit the application of uh, nanoparticles at commercial level, and uh, for that, I think we, we need a system to uh, verify the cytotoxicity or negative effects on our environment before applying those nanoparticles or nanosystems uh, at commercial level. Uh, I think it can uh, make more systematic uh, usage of these nanosystems in future. Thank you so much yes, once Hamad. again. Yes, Hamad, sorry, allow me please just to follow up on what you mentioned correctly. You are absolutely right. The fact that uh, nano uh, was an emerging uh, discipline, so to impose regulations uh, that was more or less to minimize or stop the stop, the, how can I say, the fast, uh, uh, industrial or uh, the, the fast R&D translation of nano. That is why the USA, Europe, China, and other countries have not imposed regulations at the beginning, but rather allowed it to move on. But in our case in the South, and in particular the Islamic countries, it is, in a, how can I say, as I mentioned, I think uh, not to uh, impose the regulation straightforward, but, but to work, uh, to, uh, to establish this regulation and to establish a protocol of R&D translations and therefore work hand to hand and not uh, as a restrictive uh, approach, but work hand to hand to ensure that uh, the translation takes place while the regulation has been done in the same time. So to ensure that uh, we will not hamper the, uh, how can I say, the R&D translation and entrepreneurship of these young fellows who and the junior fellows and the senior fellows who are involved in this endeavor. If we impose the regulation straightforward, uh, they will leave. There will be so many burdens that they will leave. No, no, here we cannot. Errare umano persevare e diabolico. The error is human. To continue doing the same error is the job of the devil. We cannot. Here, it's an opportunity for youngsters to embark in entrepreneurship. Give them a chance. Give them a chance not to impose so much regulations. At least, at least for uh, fields where there is no need, where the, how can I say, the harmful aspect is not uh, much. We need to balance. We need to have a really balance between regulations and allow fellows to go for entrepreneurship. And the health aspect here, this is what is a sound in the Islamic countries, is that uh, countries like uh, Pakistan and Iran are just, just absolutely, extremely competent in it. And this is a force. 
that should be nurtured and uh, taken in consideration and avoid duplication because uh, this equipment of, uh, how can I say, cytotoxicity, uh, health aspect and so on, they are not cost effective. While Pakistan, for example, and Iran, but Pakistan in particular, they have, they have the technology. So therefore, one could think about this virtual nano center, Islamic nano center as a node consisting of pockets of excellence, the one in the health in Pakistan, uh, the water maybe in Jordan, uh, the, uh, 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 the nanofluids in Iran, because for the nanofluids, the most active country in the region is Iran in terms of uh, theory. So it is possible to grow. And in fact, this virtual uh, Islamic uh, EIS uh, uh, nano center could definitely have uh, the UNESCO label and uh, how can I say, and it can be formed straightforward because you have everything in effect. Well, I can, I should stop there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dr. Smail Bodja, please go ahead and ask your question. Is it is not there, maybe? Okay, Dr. Leila, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malik, uh, for this uh, very rich information and a comprehensive uh, one, uh, specifically about what's happening in our part of the world. Thank you very much again. Uh, I am very concerned about uh, the biosafety and toxicity that you have already discussed. And uh, I agree very much with uh, having a reasonable balance uh, so that to keep our young generation working, but at the same time, you know, reasonably uh, having the awareness uh, regarding that when working with the nanotechnology, with the nanoparticles specifically. I would like to ask about how do you see in the coming 10 years, for example, uh, where are we going in this part of the world? Are we going, for example, I think, in terms of uh, using it uh, in fertilizers, in insecticides, uh, and in food production, I think, besides water? Again, for energy, I agree very much. And I cannot agree more than having uh, a center of excellence that can take care of linking, not only for regulatory purposes, but again, for linking uh, scientists in this part of the world. So if you please, if I can hear from you regarding the coming 10 years, where are we going in this part of the world? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Uh, you have... Uh... Uh, highlighted a really a strategic aspect. What, uh, in terms of the future, uh, the future prof, uh, what is uh, sure is that uh, uh, we are, uh, how can I say, our society is uh, driven by artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, the Artificial intelligence uh, is, uh, or uh, nanoscience or nanotechnologies are pivotal to artificial intelligence. Therefore, you would you would likely, uh, or we would likely uh, uh, expect a huge amount of uh, implants, uh, uh, nano system, nano devices. And plant, uh, and plants in the in the brain, uh, uh, under the skin, uh, uh, under the skin, for example, uh, nearby the wrist, to measure the blood. Uh, uh, how can I say, the cholesterol, uh, the blood pressure, 
and so on and so on. So we will definitely have a, an equivalent of a bionic system, a bionic uh, applications uh, uh, to measure. Uh, and we, how can I say, also uh, for those who are, uh, as in my case, uh, I have had a stroke, uh, my left uh, hand uh, is not fully operational. So therefore, definitely there would be a possibility to have an implant, uh, a chip under the skin of, uh, 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 for the brain to activate parts of the brain and to make, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, other parts of the body operational. For example, also implants in the eye, which would be very sensitive to infrared, Therefore, even if the person cannot see uh, the different colors, but she will or he will uh, see uh, the shape of the, the object in terms of uh, heat radiated by that, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, by that object. In terms of, Prof, uh, you mentioned something which is extremely hot topic and hot topic and kept secret. We have really, now to move fast on it. And I'm grateful to my colleagues from Pakistan who really helped us in that regard. I am really amazed. Allow me for, uh, uh, to share with you uh, just a, uh, a slide or two on something that we, I have missed to, uh, uh, in effect, I have escaped in effect. and it's related to nanofertilizers. You are absolutely right, Prof. It is a hot topic. And uh, uh, companies in the US are uh, sponsoring uh, quite a number of groups and requesting them not to publish. And these are colleagues from us, from Connecticut, for example. The largest center, yeah, the, large, the largest center uh, for, uh, uh, next generation of fertilizers. Here, uh, Prof, uh, something that we have developed with our colleagues from uh, Pakistan, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, it's related to uh, the usage of nanoparticles of zinc as nanofertilizers. In effect, the zinc oxide is not harmful. Uh, it is not uh, toxic. It is used extensively. Its biocompatibility has been investigated extensively. It is also, uh, zinc oxide is used as a, a cream uh, to stop the UV when we go, uh, how can I say, to avoid the skin cancer. And it is used as a whitener for the two teeth brush, uh, for the teeth uh, paste. And it happened that uh, the zinc is extremely very important in the plant uh, milk, uh, growth mechanism. And it happened, uh, uh, in particular, in the case of tomatoes, it it is extremely very effective. So what we uh, what we have done with our colleagues from Pakistan, we used zinc oxide uh, we that we made synthesized via nano biosynthesis, uh, green chemistry, really green nanochemistry in the real sense of the word, without using any acid or base, just a natural extract from the plants. And we use the plant in particular from Pakistan, just to show in this case, uh, uh, one from Pakistan, one from South Africa, to show that we are capable to reproduce the protocol in both countries. And as you can see, uh, in terms of uh, average uh, uh, height growth of the plant relatively to the controlled one, it's very high, as you can see. The green one show clearly the, the leaves uh, grow faster uh, the height is higher and so on and so on, and the flowers and so on and so on. So it is a very effective fertilizer. And the zinc is a part, uh, a component of the plant. So uh, we are very well aware now about the mechanism. It is our Pakistani colleagues that we have managed to find exactly uh, uh, how the mechanism of uh, these uh, nanofertilizers act on the plant and well, uh, I must admit we complemented each other, but the point is yes, and next generation of fertilizers would be 
based not on the phosphate type materials because uh, how can I say we know the negative aspect uh, of the current fertilizers and insecticides and uh, so the move now in particular from uh, which was initiated and directly by the Connecticut colleagues in the US is that uh, copper, copper oxide and copper as well as the zinc and the zinc sulfides are ideal as a fertilizers. I hope that I have uh, addressed uh, Prof uh, your uh, question. Yeah, sure you did. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, really, we are undertaking something uh, uh, similar in collaboration with our colleagues in the School of Agriculture. And uh, uh, I would like uh, to ask that uh, the institution, the UN institutions, including uh, UNESCO and the Islamic World Academy of Science and everyone to to stress the importance and enhance what's existing in terms of the multidisciplinary approach yes. for uh, research purposes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Malik, and thank you very much, Professor Abdullah, for organizing this very important uh, meeting. Thank you. Uh, Prof, uh, allow, allow me just to mention that uh, uh, our UNESCO chair do have indeed some uh, fellowships for our uh, fellows from the, the South. So we will be delighted, uh, how can I say, once this pandemic is over, inshallah, we will be delighted to receive uh, fellows from your group. And we are ready, we are, uh, ready to cooperate with you, Prof. Uh, send me an email and we start. Definitely, no problem, Prof. Uh, Thank okay. You. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raja. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Maza, for this uh, very interesting uh, and uh, presentation. Uh, I am Professor Raja from Morocco. Huh? So, uh, the, uh, Dr. Maza, please, um, have you some idea for application for nano application in? Uh, in nuclear physics. As you know, I am professor in nuclear physics. I'm working in many applications of nuclear physics in uh, energy particles and also in medical physics. And I'm curious if you have an idea of some application in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Raja uh, Shirkawi. Uh, I'm really glad uh, uh, that Prof. Raja uh, Shirkawi attended, I'm really honored by her presence, in effect, and by the presence of everybody, but specifically Prof. Sharqawi, who was uh, uh, a L'Oreal UNESCO awardee for women in science. I do remember in the time of uh, late Ahmed Ziwail, uh, Prof. Sharqawi has just uh, been selected without any discussion, straightforward. Uh, all of the members of the jury have voted for her straightforward. In effect, she saved us time. And uh, I think, uh, Prof. Sharqawi, uh, you are a member of a number of academies. And I think the, uh, uh, the, our academy is orphan and would be orphan if uh, you would not join us uh, as a member. That is, uh, how can I say, from one aspect. The other one, uh, 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 is in response to your uh, question, uh, allow me please to share uh, uh, some a slide in that regard. Let me just to uh, yes, it is. For example. Uh, 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 in terms of usage of nano systems uh, in high energy physics, and specifically to something which is a really of extreme importance, the standard model is uh, the standard model. How can I say? Yes, you may say that uh, uh, nano nano systems are maybe 
not really uh, related to the standard model. No, no. It is possible to find uh, an application. In the standard model, uh, in the standard model, uh, uh, the, uh, how can I say, we are, uh, it's based of a number of uh, uh, basic particles, uh, the quarks, and these quarks form when they bind together up and down quarks, they form the different particles, in particular the, new, the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons. But in the case of a neutron, a neutron, a free neutron, uh, will always decay to a proton and a, a neutrino and an anti-electron. An anti-neutrino and an electron. And uh, uh, this uh, neutron, uh, before decaying to that, uh, from its birth to its decay, uh, it has a lifetime. And this lifetime is very important to the to the standard model, and therefore to the, uh, the notion of the quark gluon nature. So in such a case, it is well known that the neutron decays to these uh, particles, and it has a fixed lifetime before decaying. And the decay is through a boson, W minus, and in effect, uh, uh, there are two techniques to, which allows to measure this uh, neutron lifetime. When it is born as an independent neutron until its decay. And the lifetime uh, was measured by two different techniques, which, were, which gave always 14 minutes, 39 seconds, or uh, the beam method, which gives 14 minutes, 48 seconds. And this difference of around uh, 10 uh, seconds is extremely important. And up to now, the community of uh, high energy physics cannot uh, distinguish between uh, these uh, two. Either you use the method, it gives you this uh, time here, 1439, or you use uh, beam time, it gives you, uh, 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 sorry, the beam time gives you that uh, time life, or the beam, the bottle uh, technique gives you that. And uh, this, this, uh, the precision on this uh, time life is extremely important because it is related to the ratio of neutron relatively to the protons as at the early stage of the birth of universe. And it is related also to the amount of light elements, hydrogen, helium, and so on. So it is important to measure this uh, uh, time here with a high precision. And in that regard, uh, as I mentioned, uh, large experiments uh, made in the US at Los Alamos and, uh, 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 and other parts of the, uh, in Grenoble, in uh, France, and other parts of the world. But this uh, ratio, uh, uh, the lifetime of the neutron is related to this ratio and uh, to this uh, simple equation, which is re related to the Bing Bang dynamic. And for as such, uh, two techniques are used. This, as I mentioned, the bottle and uh, the bottle technique. And uh, let me just say, sorry. The bottle, the, the, the bottle technique and the, the beam technique. While in our case, we have, uh, how can I say, we have our colleagues from uh, uh, France and uh, other parts of the world. We have uh, in Russia, in Dubna, we propose the usage of a, a sandwich, uh, a nano sandwich of a nickel, vanadium and the nickel. The thickness here is 100, I think, and here it's 1,000, and here, I don't know, 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, and 10 nanometers of nickel and vanadium. And the idea is to trap the neutron inside and trapping it and measuring its uh, time, uh, uh, 
and, uh, and measuring the time that uh, the neutron is spending here, and therefore bring it uh, to uh, the lifetime of, of uh, the. Uh, uh, so uh, by measuring these resonances that we obtain uh, on the spectrum, it is possible by using really the limit of uh, uncertainty that is the quantum mechanic uncertainty of Heisenberg, and to calculate the time life that the neutron has uh, spent in the react uh, in the nano resonator. And as you can see, it's in the millisecond. So the precision that uh, is uh, uh, reached by nano systems uh, for uh, uh, the lifetime of the neutron is limited by the quantum mechanic limit that is the Heisen Heisenberg uncertainty. So it is a way to enhance the precision on the life of the lifetime of the neutron in that regard, uh, Prof. So, so the, the response is yes, indeed, it's possible to combine these nanostructures to, uh, to address some nuclear fundamental uh, aspect of nuclear physics. And of course, this nano can be uh, once uh, nanoparticles won't be once conjugated with the uh, uh, radioisotopes, uh, radioisotope uh, uh, labeling of nanoparticles can be used uh, for cancer treatment of tumors, which will be uh, triggered by radiation, by gamma rays or uh, protons, proton therapy and so on. And we do this at Itambalapsia in the Cape. Thank you, Malik. Thank you very much. Huh? As you know, uh, currently we are in Morocco. We are working in the upgrade of uh, the Atlas experiments at CERN. And so we are discovering many, many things. And I think it's very important for the technology transfer in our country. But thank you. And uh, thank you for, um, for emphasize of cooperation. I think it's very, very important to have collaboration uh, worldwide. Thank you, Mary. Absolutely, Thank absolutely. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mani Kandam, please go ahead. Dr. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, good, go good day to all. Hi, Prof. Maza. Thanks for your excellent uh, wide spectrum of your talk. I'm listening for the past two decades you are, uh, today your talk is far excellent than other talks because of today you have covered the entire electromagnetic spectrum and related applications. So I'm very happy. So uh, my question is whether you have quantified so far any nanoparticle for the practical day-to-day -day application in the industrial scale. Just I want to know the industrial scale of part. Apart from that, how many of the biomarker or bio uh, indicator produced from your laboratory for the biomedical application. Can you please specify? Thank you. The one, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, Manikandan. Uh, me too, I am very well aware about uh, the outstanding activities of uh, biomedical applications of your excellent center indeed. And I hope that we will continue to pursue this collaboration between us. The from our side, the, uh, uh, the application on the life sciences uh, are not really our major focus, but nonetheless, it is a, a, a research that we do conduct. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, mass production, I do, uh, how can I say, I wish to stress uh, that up to now, we have not uh, targeted the mass production and uh, industrial uh, scaling of uh, the production of these nanoparticles. However, however, we have identified some specific ones like the one that I showed for the cerium oxide, which has a very low ROS uh, production, yet a very effective antibacterial and uh, very effective UV uh, uh, filter. 
that I think, uh, how can I say, I must admit that you helped us a lot in that regard. This one, I think we would uh, go for uh, a mass production, hopefully, and uh, try to market it as a product uh, in South Africa and in Africa and the rest of the world, hopefully, because it is really unique in terms of UV filtering and, uh, uh, how can I say, and uh, antibacterial response. This one, yes, we will, uh, we are targeting it in terms of engineering to see how much uh, uh, we inject, how much we can produce uh, at a laboratory scale. And if we scale it, is it possible to produce uh, 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 at, the, at the kilogram level? I hope uh, that uh, Prof. Marie Kandana, I have, uh, I hope that I responded to your uh, uh, question. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed, please go ahead. Um, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to introduce myself. I'm Ahmed Galmed, Associated Professor in uh, National Institute of Laser Enhanced Sciences in Cairo University. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Marek for his uh, very, very interesting talk. And uh, I'm happy that to see Dr. Marek uh, fine and in good health. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just um, uh, have a comment on Dr. Hamid's uh, question that uh, it's, not it's, it's not essential to have the nanoparticles in water uh, in a free form. Uh, it can be used um, somehow localized so that we can purify the water without, uh, um, without uh, contaminating the water so much with the nanoparticles. Uh, my question to Dr. Malik also about uh, uh, purifying water because it's very, very interesting and very important uh, uh, issue. Um, what is uh, the rate or, or what is the rate of purifying the water uh, good enough to, uh, to be used in a, in a commercial uh, uh, scale? Uh, and uh, is there any studies about the size and shape of the, the nanoparticles that will affect this rate of, of purifying the water? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first of all, if when it comes to the uh, the photocatalysis, uh, the water treatment by photocatalysis, it's a very effective uh, because uh, how can I say the uh, uh, the dyes uh, uh, it it can it, it destroys dye both uh, microbes dyes and so on and so on. So uh, it is a really very effective, the combination of the, in particular the UV and the photocatalytic uh, activity of the nano TiO2 uh, in killing uh, germs and in killing uh, this large uh, uh, amount of uh, contaminant in water and decomposition of the dyes and so on, it is uh, really effective. Uh, and uh, uh, what is what is uh, the weakness in this system is that uh, their regeneration. You can, if you have one kilogram of nano titania, you can indeed uh, uh, decontaminate a large amount of water. But the idea is to re uh, kind of make them uh, very uh, active again, so to extend their life shelf time. So for a such, you have to expose them extensively to the sun. So it is possible, it is possible if you, if you regenerate and uh, regenerating them easily is uh, by uh, filtering one and uh, uh, also irradiating them with the UV. So it is possible for the photocatalysis, it is possible if combined with the 
filtration. And uh, the, their effectiveness, of course, uh, their biotoxicity, it depends on their size. The ideal is to go to smaller sizes. There is a threshold uh, where there is a maximum of uh, uh, biotoxicity. Otherwise, if you are out of that range, they are not uh, biotoxic. They are biocompatible. Yeah, uh, yes, doctor. I I'm just asking about the rates the rate of cleaning the water. Uh, is it ah, fast enough? Uh, well, uh, if you use the UV, it's very fast. If you use the solar sun, solar radiation, uh, uh, it takes you around uh, 12 hours. But if you use the UV, it's instantaneous. But for the UV, remember, in the sun, you have only 4%. In the solar radiation, you have only 4% of UV. While, uh, uh, while with the UV lamp, uh, you have a maximum in the UV, of course. So uh, you can generate, uh, regenerate it fast. You can for decompose fast. And well, if, if you have a UV and if you uh, rely only on the sun, you have therefore to dump the TiO2 to make it very active. Uh, how can I say, very active with the solar radiation. And therefore it will act the same way very fast uh, if, if dopped with the nitrogen, for example. But it is, it is, and the rural areas, uh, well, as much as, uh, how can I say, in the rural areas where you are far from the grid, the national grid, you don't have a UV, well, you rely on the sun. So therefore you use, uh, you put your container facing the sun, for uh, how can I say, for a day and allow it to cool uh, down in the during the night, and it's okay. So uh, it depends, but what is sure is that uh, hopefully with LEDs, if we can have LEDs which could uh, emit ex uh, extensively in the UV, that would uh, reduce the cost. So Thank LEDs. You so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any question? There are some uh, questions uh, from Dr. Azhar. I don't know whether Dr. Azhar wants to ask them or... Uh... You go ahead. You have, you have the list. Yeah, I do have the list. Uh, these are, uh, number one, the highly unhealthy pollutions in most of the cities in the world consist of nanoparticles. Will the nanotechnology help to take care of it or could it make the situation worse? This is question number one, Dr. Maza, please. Yes, a professor is absolutely right. In effect, uh, the major pollution in the cities are coming from, uh, there are carbon use, carbon-based uh, uh, nanoparticles coming from uh, coal stations, coming from uh, cars, mm -hmm. car emissions, and so on. He is absolutely right. Prof. Ashgar has pointed to the major, if not the supreme polluter in cities, that is carbon-based materials. And uh, one of the possibilities is to have, uh, uh, to have uh, a paint, a, a smart paint, which is electrostatic, uh, extensively selective for carbon materials. And therefore, the carbon emission, the carbon nanoparticles emitted by cars and so on, when they come and this, uh, on this paint, they stick on it. So it is a way uh, to uh, clean the air by uh, uh, electrostatically by using this electrostatic non-active nano-paint on the walls. And at a certain moment, that wall will become, you will see it, it, will, uh, it will be black, and therefore there is a huge amount of uh, dirt so that you can clean, you should clean. And this, there is a city uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Sweden, Uppsala, which is uh, testing uh, at a real, uh, uh, at a real dimension, this uh, uh, cleaning paint. 
at certain extent. So yes, there is a possibility to clean air using uh, nanofiltrations, of course, but using this electrostatic active nano paint. Yeah, question number two. What is the average size of a nanoparticle in terms of basic atoms? Is it a classical physics-based system or does one need quantum mechanics with its specific correlations? Uh, Prof, again, he is right, absolutely. He, point the, he pointed to something extremely important. The, as we mentioned, any particle which has a size, one of the three sizes of that particle, if it is less than 100 nanometer, it's called a nanometer, a nanoparticle. And as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, 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 the a nanometer is equivalent to 10 atoms of gold close, put close to each other. It's a necklace of 10 atoms of gold close to each other. That chain of 10 atoms of gold is, uh, has a length of a nanometer. And uh, of course, each of these particles, uh, the optical behavior or the physical or chemical behavior of this chain of particle of this part uh, of this chain of uh, particles is governed by the behavior of each of these part of these atoms and an atom is at the quantum mechanic it's the uh, it's uh, how can i say its physical or chemical properties are governed by quantum mechanic by the principle of uh, heisenberg uncertainty and therefore the properties are governed by quantum mechanic indeed prof is right yeah, the third question. Uh, it seems that the process of life is basically quantal in nature, needing its treatment through PICO technology. What is the situation of this field at present? Again, uh, I'm really excited that Prof is so multidisciplinary in his mind and his uh, way of uh, asking questions. Indeed, Prof. Ashgar is right. Why? Because uh, uh, as we have seen uh, the case of the bacteria, for example, which was created millions of years ago, it is, uh, how can I say, and the magnetostatic bacteria, they do produce, uh, they do produce uh, nano crystals inside of them. They are nano biofactory themselves to orient themselves. And we have mentioned as a second example, the leaf, al-waraqa, waraqat shajra or waraqat leaf of any plant. A leaf of any plant consists of this granai and the tilakoids and the size uh, is in uh, the nanometer scale and they are ordered. But what I have not mentioned, uh, and this uh, tilakoids and so on are surrounded by chlorophyll. What I have not mentioned when I said that the photon is absorbed for during the photosynthesis to create an electron hole pair, what I have not mentioned is how fast this uh, electron is absorbed. It's in a femtosecond how fast these electrons and the holes are transported. It's in the picosecond and how fast the the CO2 is decomposed in the nanoseconds and how fast uh, the carbohydrate are formed as a food for the, uh, the, for the leaf and uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the plant. Uh, uh, it is in the, in the microseconds and the physio uh, properties are in the microseconds. Yes, Prof is right. In effect, these nanosystems, they have their uh, time-wise, they touch different scales of time. They can be as very fast as a femtosecond and uh, very uh, uh, reaching the picosecond, nanoseconds, and so on. And they can be also slow, but they, can, they, they touch a different time scale. Thank you. 
Uh, the fourth question, is there a preference for the organic nanosystem over the inorganic ones because of carbon-based life on the earth? Yes, Prof is right. In fact, uh, I think Prof should really advise NASA. With his question, he should really advise NASA because what happened is that uh, uh, organic systems have a higher superiority on the inorganic because the organic systems can self uh, uh, assemble and uh, have the capacity of molecular recognition. So they can self assemble. You just put them in a pot and uh, according to the temperature, the pressure and so on, they will regulate themselves to self assemble themselves. It's like a DNA. We have uh, the different branches, the compounds, uh, bricklets, the TGAs of the, uh, of the DNA, and the, how can I say, self-assemble in a way to give uh, a structure which has a functionality. It's correct. The uh, self-assembly and molecular recognition is proper to organic systems, which are carbon, sulfur, hydrogen rich. So it is indeed, they are far superior. And uh, tissue engineering, for example, uh, quite a number of groups are working on uh, 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 organic uh, uh, systems to, uh, for their self-assembly. Okay, the fifth question for solar-based photovoltaic systems, can the nanotechnology help to increase the solar energy conversion efficiency beyond around 15% for the silicon-based systems? Some concrete examples will be helpful, please. I would, ha I would hope that really to have a supervisor during my PhD or MSc, uh, MSc Professor Ashgar, because he is a really an encyclopedia. Yes, he is right. Yes, absolutely, he's right. For the silicon, uh, it was uh, at a certain moment in the 50s, uh, in the 15s, it has reached around uh, uh, 14, 13, between 13 and 14 percent in the rate of conversion. But when we, when the community involved in the photovoltaics started to use laser to uh, nanostructure the surface of the photovoltaics of the silicon in particular, creating uh, antenna, creating a rough surface, and this rough surface. Uh, was able to trap, to trap more light and therefore to convert more light to, uh, uh, to electricity. In addition to that, the, how can I say, uh, nanoparticles, uh, the photovoltaics in particular, they were not using the infrared. They were using only the visible photons to be converted, but uh, with the, with the current technologies we have uh, uh, in the photovoltaics, among others, uh, they use nanoparticles uh, <coughs> to convert the, photo, the, the infrared photons to visible uh, light. So increasing, uh, in addition, the, uh, uh, the photo conversion. And therefore, currently, we are above 23% uh, in the... Uh, in terms of uh, conver photo conversion, and somehow we reached the, the limit, the theoretical limit for, uh, how can I say, for multi-layered systems, which are uh, nano thin film based photovoltaics, they are expensive, and that all of them, all the PVs, and they reach 30%, all the PVs in uh, space stations, being is the Chinese one, or being the ISS, all the photovoltaics are nano-based because they, uh, they convert solar light at 30% instead of 15%, so twice. 
Yeah, the last question uh, from Dr. Azhar goes like this. A macro piece of gold is yellow in color, but it goes over to a multicolored rainbow at nanoscale. Is it not just due to the optical diffraction process at this scale? Ah, uh, yeah, no, uh, it's not a diffraction. Uh, well, it is a diffraction somehow, Prof, uh, but it is a radar plasmonic nature, not a diffraction. It's not a me diffraction. It's not a Rayleigh diffraction. It's a plasmonic uh, uh, phenomena. The electrons which are uh, uh, in the nanoparticles of gold, uh, they are, uh, how can I say, they vibrate according to the frequency of the electric field of the photon, which is coming on and pinging on them. So they vibrate uh, in a resonance, uh, forming a type of a plasma. And therefore, the, uh, there is an electric field, a local one, which, uh, which uh, is created. And that plasma response is uh, 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 at the origin of their absorption and therefore at their selective absorption, a different colors, a uh, uh, different frequency in the visible, therefore uh, 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 the color of uh, the nano gold. So it is pro uh, proper to plasmonic. It's not a proper uh, diffraction, but rather plasmonic phenomena. Uh, okay, uh, if there is no more questions. I would like to ask one question. Dr. Bhatt, you want to ask? Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. My question is, uh, you know, you have asked most of the questions which I wanted to ask uh, to Dr. Mar Malik. The, the last question I would like to ask, when you want to increase the storage capacity, you have to decrease the size of the nanoparticles. That's what you have talked about. But if you go on decreasing the size of the particle, there's a problem. The problem is that what they call the cross talk. You cannot go beyond that because then the system gets gets confused. You have to say anything about that. Absolutely, Prof, you are right. Here we are the, how can I say, we cannot increase, we cannot decrease uh, limitless. Uh, we would reach uh, limit, the theoretical limit. And here, Prof, uh, I think we would be reaching uh, the entanglement limit here. So uh, uh, there is definitely a limit that we cannot uh, go above, uh, below. Yeah. Yes, oh. can I say, can I say, I, can I say thank you to Dr. Malik for a very, very comprehensive talk and it was a re really very, very enriching to everybody like me who doesn't know very much about things. Thank you very much for a very excellent talk and we hope to have you sometime in the future. All the best. Thank, thank you, you. thank you. Thank you. Dr. Malik, can I yes, yes. ask you one or two questions? As you wish, uh, DG. Yeah, uh, well, I'm inspired by your talk about uh, photocatalysis and by the comment uh, given by Dr. Ahmed uh, Jalma about the possibility or the, let me say what the scale that we can use the, the titanium oxide in treatment or in restoring ecosystem of uh, so of uh, trophic lake or a river, can we do that? Or yes, at what bro. scale we can? Uh, DG, form? yes, it is possible to produce a mass scale TiO2, and it's possible to clean a lake. Yes, it is possible. We uh, we think that is impossible. No, it is possible. <laughs> Without if endangering we, the uh, ecosystem? No, no, because this system has been investigated extensively. What could be done is that you have a lake, instead to put a powder, a huge amount of powder in the lake, it would be wise to uh, make a system whereby you 
uh, a container that water flows in that container that container contains the you pour the TiO2 in that container of let's say uh, uh, 100 liter uh, or 200 liters whatever the container you expose it to the UV you clean that amount of water you filter it it goes it's filtered and you bring uh, another amount uh, of water from the lake in that container you, you shine with the uv you clean you remove it and you so to ensure that you are using the same amount a small amount of uh, titania that you regenerate at each time when you are bringing uh, a new volume of uh, water to be treated instead to pour a huge amount of uh, uh, titanium oxide in a lake no i think uh, one should use uh, a limited amount in a container through which you are pushing for different amount, quantity of water to be treated under the UV and to, to come out. Yeah, but th this uh, consume a lot of time and a lot of energy to extract water uh, to a container, then pump it back to the lake, isn't it? Uh, no, 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 Prof. No, no, you can do it. Uh, you can do you cannot use only one container you can use different containers you multiply you you do in parallel yeah, so but, yeah it's uh, but there will be an energy consumption and co2 no there emissions. will be no energy consumption you allow you leave water to come in and here the unique energy that is required is uh, uv uv lamps yeah pumping uh, the water from the lake to the containers uh, I think you can always manage to bring that water uh, playing on the height. Okay, the other uh, comment I have is uh, I read that uh, a company in uh, Sweden, I think, they promote a product uh, which is called liquid nano uh, particles that they claim that it can reclamate uh, deserts and it can enrich the soil so that it can be productive. Do you have any idea about this? Uh, DJ, I don't have uh, idea about this, but what I know is that uh, uh, groups uh, at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, they are interested to use uh, these uh, nano fertilizers this new emerging type of nano fertilizers uh, how can i say to it gain a little fertilizer. bit it's, it, it is not fertilizer it can ah. uh, what they said what they claim that it can retain moisture in the in the soil profile ah this is possible yes this is possible yes keeping moisture yes it is possible because uh, in effect, uh, instead to be hydrophilic, they are hydrophobic. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry. Instead to be hydrophobic, they are hydrophilic. They, uh, they catch water. Yes, it is possible, this. Yeah. Is there any more questions from the audience? Dr. Nurbat, please go ahead. Doctor, Doctor Noor, you are muted. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks you very much. I just wanted to make uh, two, three minutes comments uh, on future and uh, some of the questions which are uh, uh, mentioned but not answered. I think the future direction we should go to the industry uh, with respect to our o OIC countries. The word over I know. Uh, there are one to two trillion dollar uh, world marketing of nano uh, products as estimated by the US NSF. Uh, but our countries, I think uh, we should concentrate on specific uh, needs of the industry uh, funding are relevant to our own countries. For example, in Pakistan, we have the need of textiles applications, a lot of textiles, uh, antibacterial textiles and um, a uh, very strong uh, type of textiles are being applied to. Uh, the, the second uh, is the um, 
medicine is a revolution in nano medicine. All types of diseases, uh, all types of uh, diagnostics have been improved. And I think uh, this is a public oriented uh, requirement which our country should have. Uh, the other thing uh, which I like to uh, see in future is the, uh, you know, this technology is a, a highly uh, specific technology and multidisciplinary in nature. It requires a specific education. And the world over now, there is a, a prominence of uh, having specific education in nanotechnology at the level BS, MS, and of course, PhD research is multidisciplinary. At Pinstec, we have uh, tried for 10 years uh, a very good experiment of multidisciplinary BS degree in nanoscience and nanotechnology, and it has given very good results. And the Chinese have uh, uh, taken about 40 of our graduates in their, in their nanocenters. So some of these uh, comments, I think, uh, are important for our countries. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, Professor Maza has mentioned about uh, a center. In Iran, there is already one center, and I think we need, do need uh, uh, cooperation uh, in maybe in some other countries, wherever uh, there is more expertise relevant to our own needs. So we should stress on the applications of the nanotechnology uh, in, 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 the, in the relevant industries of our countries. As I've mentioned, we have uh, in Pakistan relevance of uh, uh, textiles uh, industry and sports and goods. We export a lot of it. And there's a lot of improvement using nano uh, particles. I know I, there's no time in go going into details. Uh, Professor Asir has rightly mentioned the, the future of uh, Pico technology. Already uh, a book of about 750 pages has been written uh, by a professor from uh, Hawaii on Pico technology. And he has predicted a lot of uh, uh, experimental applications in electronics, dealing with electrons and so on. And already I think Pico satellites are in the, uh, are in the space, very small, up to a few grams. Uh, having the same sort of efficiencies which uh, bigger satellites have. So uh, there is a great scope in the, in the applications in, at PICO technology, even in, in uh, treatment of diseases at the, uh, at the uh, subatomic level. So I think uh, very, uh, very, I congratulate uh, Professor Maza to cover lost lot of uh, uh, extended seminar. And we in OIC, I think needs uh, to concentrate on specific applications of nanotechnology in series of seminars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I see that Dr. Harit Buzain wants to ask a question. Dr. Yeah, Harit. Thank, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, let me please introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Khalid Buzian. Uh, I am a professor in uh, Morocco at the International University of uh, Rabat. And I am the Dean of the School of Energy. I met, of course, uh, this, uh, I, I am so happy uh, to see uh, Malik always in exercise. Uh, I met him, uh, well, several decades ago, I will say. And we were working on nanoscale since the 90s, huh? the beginning 90s and uh, in France. And I'm so happy to see that he's in good shape. And this is uh, very nice. I think uh, what I would like to say, it's not really a question. And I thank uh, Malik for uh, his uh, comprehensive uh, wide audience uh, seminar. And uh, I think this is very interesting for uh, people working on different fields at, uh, in the nano scale uh, uh, regime. Uh, well, um, I think uh, Professor Be uh, just before me mentioned the most uh, important things that uh, in our university, we are uh, actually, um, our research is market oriented, is industry oriented uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, one uh, good reason is to tackle uh, problems of the society. And I think at uh, the, uh, our uh, May school, energy school, where mainly uh, research is focused on renewable energies, uh, mainly in, on photovoltaics, for example, and uh, for lithium-based batteries, and uh, uh, also whatever energy efficiency in buildings and so on. And I think this is a very important field for the future. 
and I would like to ask or suggest how far we can build for with this uh, present audience a platform uh, for uh, exchange and for uh, for collaboration on this very important field of the future. Maza, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Khalid. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I was just to uh, more or less uh, go on your footprint and that of Prof. Uh, but in uh, stressing on the fact that uh, we have to embark extensively in entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship training of our uh, postgrads, and to translate this R and D from the lab to the so to the society and to create industries, reliable uh, uh, industries locally. Uh, and in that regard, it is necessary to have, uh, how can I say, to duplicate the successful story of Prof. Bat at uh, uh, his university. And therefore, uh, to go for uh, 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 a PhD or an MSc specialized in a multidisciplinary field of nanosciences and nanotechnology with an additional uh, uh, the training in terms of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurship uh, and commercialization and involve in these courses, involve as early as possible uh, fellows from the business sector. So to ensure that we will have uh, stakeholders from the economic sector and of course, uh, to gear the, the research activities of uh, uh, some of the fellows towards uh, the needs of the local industries. And these local industries, their problems is the same thing as in Pakistan or as in uh, South Africa or in Morocco and so on. So for example, a niche area that Prof. Bat has mentioned, smart and intelligent uh, uh, textiles is going on. I mean, India, Mauritius uh, are investing extensively in it indeed. Uh, and why? Because uh, this uh, new type of uh, smart textiles, they are antibacterial, uh, uh, they are uh, 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 super hydrophobic. When it rains, they are uh, water does not penetrate and so on. So. Uh, Again, but for this, I think it is really critical to have for a, such an international cooperation, at least from the South, we need the moral support of the EIS to, for the creation of a virtual a nano center within the OIC, IAS, uh, how can I say, uh, countries and uh, involving the members of the diaspora we from the South African perspective, we will be delighted to act as a, a member of this uh, virtual node of excellence of uh, the uh, OAC IAS uh, uh, virtual center of excellence. And no. correct, each of, sorry? Each no, of these, uh, vir yeah, sorry. Each of these virtual centers could contribute and we can have exchange fellows from center to a center because the junior centers are the blood of uh, the, the lab. So we can exchange between our senior and junior scientists, <coughs> wherever we are in Morocco, in, uh, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Jordan, in Oman, in Qatar and so on. Let's, uh, how can I say, move all together, identify programs which are uh, proper to all of us. And if we don't have infrastructure uh, here in South Africa, we send the samples to Pakistan, we send them to Jordan, Jordan send them to Morocco, Morocco sends that to us. So we create this uh, culture of cooperation between us and including even the members of the diaspora. This center can be created easily, does not require any initial funding, but a moral guarantee from the IAS as an umbrella with the nodes of excellence in different countries. And once we are at that level, when we produce some success stories, then we can go for a joint funding to the Kuwait Foundation, to uh, other foundation, to the uh, Comstack and so on. 
So we should create this uh, virtual nano center of the EIS. Is there any more comments? Hello. Yeah. Yes. One one question which we have not discussed during this talk. That's about because the now there's a push for the cars to avoid using petrol and go over to electric cars. And there's a problem, a fundamental problem for the electric cars is the battery. Yeah. Battery. At the moment, the best battery we have is of lithium ions. Is there a possibility? to have uh, nanotechnology to increase uh, the, the storage energy capacity of the batteries. I mean, the, 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 the weak point for the electric cars are the batteries. How to improve the batteries with nanotechnology? Uh, uh, Prof, uh, what, uh, how can I say, what is sure what is coming uh, currently is uh, uh, there are different uh, approaches to enhance the, the storage capacity, either using uh, uh, lithium-based batteries, which are the most promising for the moment, and in parallel using super capacitors with a high capacity storage. So uh, there are different technologies. Each of them uh, are promising. The one who is the most promising is the lithium batteries based because the urgency of the matter uh, and because uh, the climate change uh, 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 push by uh, highly advanced countries such as Germany, uh, Europe in general, USA and Japan. So there is a push for that. But uh, sooner or later, we would have a, a combination uh, in addition to the standard or the most uh, effective lithium batteries, uh, uh, Zebra type. Uh, there are other uh, potential component technologies which will come with it such as the supercapacitors. If there is a, Prof, I think the pressure is so huge. It's so huge on the uh, car industry that they, are, they have adopted uh, these uh, uh, nanotechnologies uh, easily. So there is a really, uh, there is a likely a possibility to reach a high capacity of storage and a fast, not only high capacity, but also fast uh, uh, storage, uh, charging, yes. I think the Tesla, there is one of the new Teslas which will be coming would uh, address these uh, 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 these challenges. But I think, Prof, Nano will be everywhere. Will be everywhere, we cannot miss it. We have missed the nuclear, we have missed the semiconductor, we have missed the bio. We have missed the ICT slightly in the south, but the nano, we cannot, we are not, uh, we are doomed not to miss it. And in this regard, uh, collaboration are extremely important and uh, uh, really, really extremely important because it allows us uh, uh, to enhance the critical mass artificially if there are 10 nanoscientists in Jordan, 20 in South Africa, five in Pakistan, three in Morocco, let's say, I'm just giving an example. The, all of us, we will be making it 50. But imagine uh, that we multiply the number of uh, uh, now people who will be involved in each uh, of the countries with us, from chemistry, from physics, from engineering, from health science and so on. We will boost this critical mass. So we will compensate and directly the investment of the government in the science. So let us create this, uh, uh, how can I say, this cooperation and cement it to, uh, to come and to address. And uh, just a typical example that I would like really to share with you as much as we are here is this. Is this the result here? which was in effect, uh, which was in effect uh, due to uh, a strong collaboration. This one, this number here speaks for itself. Yeah, this one colleagues, 
here when we were working alone uh, this is the citations of our work uh, generated in africa and this citation by our colleagues from uh, the north you would uh, see that when we were working alone it was around tens hundreds per year moved with the nano afnet and nano the unesco chair working extensively here we were limiting ourselves to african colleagues and here we opened ourselves to the south brazil pakistan in particular india china and uh, bangladesh among others uh, and the middle east as you can see the number of citation has just uh, incre is increasing in a in a, an exponential way and here it has allowed our fellows to access facilities, for example, in New Zealand, in Europe, due uh, to the cooperation with our colleagues from the diaspora, in the UK, in Sweden, in France, uh, in the US, in Canada, and so on. It has allowed us to create a new kind of fellows who have an entrepreneurship spirit who wanted to create their own, uh, uh, their own companies, their own job, and therefore to create jobs in their home countries. So I think uh, it is necessary to work together. Really, we need, we need really to, uh, we need to do the same thing as the US and China uh, and the European countries and uh, other countries, Singapore, Taiwan. We need to do the same thing in Africa and the OAC uh, and uh, the Islamic countries. We need, there is so much potential there is so much potential that can be done if we create this uh, uh, cooperation under the umbrella of the IAS uh, as a, as a, uh, uh, how can I say, a moral guarantee. Thank you. Uh, I thought that uh, Dr. Uh, Noor Bhatt want to make a comment. You want to make a comment, Dr. Noor? Um. I think um, I wanted to make some information in two ways. One is uh, CompStack uh, prepared recently uh, the specialization of various scientists in the OIC countries. Now, a similar directory of uh, specialization of nanotechnology areas could be made, which would be very useful in the suggestion which was made by Professor Malik about the cooperation. So, a similar experiences uh, in industry or in, in development of new technology of, of nano aspects could be gotten together in, in some nodes uh, within the country, five, six, seven places. And then I think sharing each other experience. The other thing um, I wanted to inform, uh, which is probably not discussed is uh, from UK, there is an abstracting uh, organization in nanotechnology applications all applications, including astrophysics, chemistry, nanotechnology, picotechnology, health physics, nanomedicine, all sorts of uh, uh, some summaries uh, of papers published in important journals like Nature or um, Scientific Advances and so on. So this, I think, uh, I receive every day about uh, five or five to ten different new developments of research published in very advanced journals. And I think uh, as subscribing to that, which is free, I think, um, would be very useful for the nano scientists to know the latest developments uh, in very uh, published and developed. Uh, questions have been raised, a lot of, uh, I think a uh, lot of answers already are in, on water pollution, uh, uh, cleanliness and so on. Uh, every day something is coming up and uh, one can find one's own areas of specialization using nanotechnology in this. The name is NanoWork, NanoWork. I can send the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, address and so on. Uh, uh, my, my email is uh, nm, but it's with the uh, IES, and I will be pleased to do that. The other is uh, we will welcome uh, nano education experiments of PS uh, uh, in multidisciplinary teaching of physics, chemistry, biology, and material science at one uh, course of 132 to our, uh, to our OIC countries. Uh, the students can come to Pakistan and we will welcome them in this new experiment, which is very successful. 
So I think the abstracting is very uh, a good source. Uh, I can, uh, it's not discussed, but it's very useful. Thank you very much. Yeah, in uh, regard uh, to cooperation, I would like to draw your attention that there is an initiative between uh, Comstec and IAS, the Islamic Academy of Sciences, <coughs> regarding the mobility of uh, scientists uh, in different disciplines uh, from LSD countries to other OIC countries to excellence to centers of excellence. But we could think to expand uh, the scale, the geographic, the geographical scale of this mobility program. So uh, I will uh, see if, if we can, uh, Dr. Malik Maza, maybe send a letter to uh, IAS and uh, Comstec in this regard so that we can initiate the process of expanding the geographical area of cooperation. We, because we are interested in sponsoring such mobility uh, programs. I will do, Prof, with a great pleasure indeed. Yeah, great. And and we will uh, consider your center as uh, an excellent center that we can direct people to it. Thank you, Prof, thank you. What is your DG is that uh, I'd like just to also to share with you the, that we are working on the creation of an open access uh, journal, uh, which would be indexed in two or three years with an impact factor. The impact factor that we are targeting, inshallah, by 2028 is 10. We wanted to ensure that this Nano Horizon journal would be of an extreme high quality and would be extremely very competitive. And of course, uh, in the editorial board, we will involve uh, quite a number of nano experts from the IAC region. Uh, great. Uh, Dr. Leila, uh, you want to make comments or something? Dr. Leila. Yeah. Okay, yes, thank you, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, it's very, in extremely interesting. Uh, I would like to comment regarding the hydrogen storage. What do you think, uh, Professor Maza, about that? Using the nanomaterial and nanoparticles. Uh, Prof. Uh, Laila, I, I, I do apologize. I must admit my uh, knowledge is limited in that field. So uh, please, I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, because there is... Uh, we, we, we limited ourselves to a number of areas. Uh, yes, the nano is very wide, but uh, I have no very solid knowledge in that regard, Prof. I'm really sorry. But if, we'll, if I find something, I will definitely revert back to you. Uh, there is no more questions. I would like really to thank Dr. Malik for uh, this comprehensive, uh, discussion and uh, talk, very nice, uh, in insightful, and enlightening, really. And apparently it excites a lot of uh, uh, participants' engagement. And I would like to thank uh, the participants, the audience, for their engagement and fruitful discussions. And I would like to remind you all of our uh, session number three in the webinar series under nanotechnology. Dr. Al-Kilani, who is a pharmaceutical nanotechnologist, will be the presenter. And the session number four will be uh, a talk by Yulango Zahu from China. Hopefully that we will see you again uh, in our activities. And now we will say bye to everybody.